this is sort of a combination of two different wrecks. And the truth is, Mary Ellen asked if I was, actually a couple years ago, asked if I was willing to do another presentation. And to be honest, I'm sort of running out of pictures that are halfway decent. So uh, what I did at the time was put two separate stories together and two different sets of wreck pictures together. So first, the oil part. The Dixie Arrow uh, had a cargo of oil. And uh, she was built in Camden, New Jersey, finished in 1921. So she was on the order of 20 some odd years old when uh, uh, she was torpedoed. Uh, she was pretty long, 468 foot, and as uh, uh, many times we've been told, don't try to swim the length of it unless you're on a rebreather or unless you're using a scooter because you're not going to make one end to the other and back again really on a normal dive. She had a very good captain. He was known to be a good captain. He was kind. He was an extremely good ship handler. He'd always try to get the best cooks available, which obviously is very important to a crew. He kept work schedules reasonable, and also uh, the crew was known to be hardworking, and they became very close because they were, you know, had a good captain. So in March of 42, she was en route from uh, Texas to New Jersey with 96,000 gallons of oil. And the captain's name was Johansson, and he was very concerned about going around Hatteras uh, for a couple reasons. One, because of submarine action that had taken place there, but also going around Hatteras, like the Hatteras Bight, was actually mined by the U.S. because ships would go in there at night to be protected. In actuality, the mines sunk more American ships and didn't sink any German subs, so it didn't work out too well. Okay, the other side of the story, the U-71 was commissioned in 1940. And her captain uh, was Walter Fleischenberg. So on the nights of March 25th and 26th, through that night, uh, he waited at night near Diamond Shoals for some you know, target to come by, but all he really saw were fishing vessels. So he was about to dive because daybreak was coming. He'd dive, sleep during the day, you know, come back up at night. But just before uh, the sunrise, they noticed some uh, mass on the horizon. And uh, so he basically dove, positioned, okay? Yeah, we can't turn the back. Oh, okay. Yeah, lift a hand if I'm not getting through. Uh, so in any case, he, he maneuver, maneuvered into position for an attack. And uh, so on the Dixie Arrow, uh, and some of us, yeah, this is something I wanted to say about this. A lot of us have dove this wreck a lot. It's sort of a favorite wreck to go to as a second dive. It's a favorite wreck to go to if the conditions are too bad to go too far offshore. We end up on the Arrow. It's, it's a favorite wreck because it has a lot of life. Uh, a lot of bait fish, a lot of sand tigers. It's just a very pretty, neat wreck. But what we forget about is what happened to get that wreck there. Okay, it was, you know, it wasn't a pretty story at all. So in any case, uh, Oscar Chappelle was on the Arrow's helm uh, when the torpedoes hit, two torpedoes. And of course the ship burst into flames the wind was sweeping those flames towards the bow of the ship. And he saw that there were seven men trapped on the bow and the flames were heading to them. So there were six other uh, men on the bridge with him. He ordered them to leave, get off the ship, get away. And he then turned the ship into the wind and basically was covered with blood because he was injured and he locked the wheel of the ship into the wind just before he was basically incinerated. But the seven men on the bow were able to jump in and save themselves. Uh, the captain emerged from the cabin, uh, his cabin in full uniform right after the first two torpedoes hit. 
and he started towards the bridge when a third torpedo hit, and he was incinerated. He died instantly in flames. After shutting down the engine, uh, a William Morph, Wolf emerged from below and saw six men launching a life raft. So he joined them, but the problem was the life raft didn't have any paddles. So it was starting to drift into the flames. And there was one of the men on board, or on the life raft, couldn't swim. And they knew they were heading into the flames. So he, he tried to convince this guy to jump off, get out, as the rest of them did. But he wouldn't, and he was incinerated as well in the flames. The men that jumped from the bow swam away from the burning well. An hour later, they saw the USS Tarbell. And uh, they were about 200 yards away, or the ship was about 200 yards from them, the Tarbell, when they saw it drop a load of depth charges. Not a good thing when you're in the water. And uh, uh, one person that gave an account said he was swimming towards the Tarbell when the first depth charge went off. And he said it felt like someone just punched him in the chest. And then when others went off, he was knocked unconscious. But he did survive, obviously, to tell the story. Eight men uh, did get away in a, uh, one remaining lifeboat. Fourteen others were in the water. They were all picked up by the Tar Bell and taken to Moorhead City. The uh, Dixie Arrow eventually, well, she was pretty much buckled in the middle to begin with, but, uh, and burning, you know, furiously, so she eventually sank. And uh, 22 men did survive the attack. 11 men were lost. About a third, I think more than a third of those were actually officers. And uh, Chappelle was awarded the Merchant Marine Distinguished Service Cross, obviously, posthumously. So on the other side, U-71, between March 17th and April 1st of 1942, she sunk five ships. And uh, during her, her career, she survived five different depth charge attacks, uh, including aerial attacks in the Bay of Biscay. And her captain, uh, well, the sub itself was, at the end of the war, scuttled in Germany. And uh, Fleischberg did eight war patrols in the U-71, and he died in 1994. So obviously survived the war. Okay, and this is obviously a NOAA side scan. Uh, the arrow sits in about 90 feet of water, upright. Uh, the boilers are back here. Valve here, stern obviously there. And uh, what we're going to do is do the two separate Let's make it two dives, one in the stern, one in the bow. And uh, on this one, we're going out on the uh, uh, under pressure. And that would be me getting the camera ready. OK, so first the stern dive. And this is you know, swimming up towards the, the rudder post, which is remaining here. Now, just an example of how wrecks are changing. Okay, this is how it looks in 2016 when I took this shot. This is what it looked like in 1996 with my old Nikonis camera. And you can see the, the rudder is still there sitting vertically. Yep, no longer there. Laid over, buried in the sand. And uh, an interesting feature, though, is the, the propeller. Yeah, you can see the blades, or the blade right there, one of the blades. And there's Penny, my wife Penny, wherever she is. Oh, she's back there. OK, and, uh, this little octopus lives off the side of the stern. And uh, one of Penny's favorite things to do when she sees an octopus is to steal one of these shells and move it out and eventually you'll see a little arm come out, take the shell, bring it back. So then she'll move another shell out. I mean, she'll harass an octopus for 10 minutes nonstop. 
Okay, uh, the Arrow had a triple expansion steam engine, and this is remains of the steam engine. I don't think I have pictures from years ago, but they used to look a lot better. You know, like 30, 40 years ago, they looked a lot better. And maybe Mark can figure that. I can't figure out what that crank is doing off the side of the engine. But I believe that's a spare. Okay, that's, that, that was my guess, but okay. Because it just doesn't make sense there because it should be in under. And just Penny swimming along it. It's, it, yeah, it's sort of sad the way the wrecks are disintegrating. <laughs> it hurts. <laughs> and uh, some of the fish life you can see, barracuda, lots of bait fish. And you'll see in a future picture the problem of the bait fish. Well, let me get that cursor out of the way. Uh, you know, penny alongside the engine, and you can see, well, you see a shadow of the third boiler over here, but two of the three boilers. and a, uh, a condenser, you know, which is when the steam comes out of the last cylinder, goes through the condenser, is cooled, convert you know, back to water again, then goes to the boiler. There you can see the third boiler a lot better, right here underpinning. Always fun to swim down between the boilers. I don't know why, but I get a charge out of it. And that is a, I had to look it up, a true tulip shell, as opposed to a tulip shell. It's a true tulip shell. And this is a problem sometimes, and that is sometimes there are so much bait fish, you have like no visibility. And it really makes it impossible to take a picture. And I will admit, I got totally lost one time on the wreck because I could get no point of reference. You know, luckily I finally found the edge of the wreck <laughs> and was able to make it back to the anchor line. The other thing you can do is sometimes come up and if they don't go too high, you can get above the bait fish and then you might see a point of reference, you know, like maybe even the anchor line if the water's really clear or at least the engine or something like that. And just a little video clip of what the bait fish look like. We can be, we can make your brain swim a little bit. Yeah. Okay, and there's Penny not harassing an all mouth. You don't want to mess with them, but I don't think she realized her hand was that close until she saw this picture. And Penny found a slate pencil urchin, which actually I noticed looking through these, uh, I forget if it's on this or the, the next wreck, but there's quite a few of them around, sort of cool. Okay, next we'll do the bow. And uh, this will give a little idea of changes. The bow's, you know, always an impressive part of the wreck. Uh, you know, it's really easy to identify and uh, you know, looks fairly, fairly large there, but it's not what we remember years ago, the bow used to go up much, much higher. So here's the bow now. This is the bow in 1986. And trust me, when you're down here in the washout looking up, it's a long way up. And well, it's, you know, I tried to get this someone up there, but it's very high, and now it's much, much lower. The plates on top are falling off, it's falling away. And yeah, this is the thing. I remember we, we hadn't dove the wreck for many years. We, we lived on a sailboat for 12 years, and during that time, we didn't dive down here. And uh, so then when we came back years later or started diving down here again, it's like, what happened to the chain locker on the arrow? because that's in, ninth, or in 2018, you know, when I took this shot, that's what it looked like in 1986. You, know, you can see the structure overhead, you can see the hull still came up there. There's no hull there anymore, it's just, you know, and actually the chain was more identifiable. Hope these pictures look good, I'm not sure. 
and of course Stingray are on the wreck. This is a shot from many years ago, and uh, what was his name? Steve Irwin. I, every time I see this picture, I'm thinking, oh my God, because trust me, that was a huge Stingray, and luckily Penny did not swim over it. She, you know, she stayed behind it. But there are some big rays on that wreck once in a while. And of course our favorites, the sand tigers. We love our sand tigers. When we started diving down here back in, ugh, I guess the 80s, yeah, probably early 80s, I don't think the 70s, 80s, you didn't see sharks. And we'd do a, a, a week camping and diving trip out of Ocracoke. Uh, we'd charter a boat up from Moorhead City, actually a guy that was a fishing captain, but uh, he'd come up and take us diving for a week. And I remember we always liked going to the tarpon because sometimes in the summer, and we would always do July 4th week, you might see a sand tiger. But that's back when the, the Japanese were coming over and I think fin fishing. You know, they get the sharks, chop off the fins. Uh, but it was rare to see a shark or especially, you know, a sand tiger. And today they're everywhere, they're great. And what's fun is to people that don't understand, you know, they look so scary and so nasty, but they really aren't. You know, we've been bumped many times, more when we were diving up north in, in cold water with poor Viz, I think. We've had one go right between the two of us already and literally hit us. I always like that when there's a bowl of fish around the, the top of it. And there's Nancy Hyde. Are they coming up yet? And what is nice on JT's boat, even for us old people, or especially for us old people, uh, is he has a lift. And you know, I was still wearing some really heavy tanks, I guess up until about four years ago. I was still in like twin 85 low pressure, which are pretty heavy. And it was no problem there because it would just lift you out of the water. But eventually I had to switch to a single high pressure tank. Okay, now the sugar part of the talk. And that would be the, I say Manuela, you say? Manuela. Manuel. Yeah. I stick with Manuela. <laughs> I don't know which is right. Uh, in any case, she was built in Newport News, uh, just up the road. And uh, finished in 1934. She's just under 400 feet long. And actually, I think she was a really pretty vessel. She has nice lines. So uh, she was part of a, uh, an 11-ship convoy. Uh, they were heading from Puerto Rico to, to New York with the load of sugar. And uh, 26,000 bags of raw sugar and 7,500 bags of refined sugar. Now that would be sweet pollution. Okay, other side of the story. U-404, commissioned in 41. Uh, she left Brest, France on uh, May 2nd of 42. It was her third war cruise, and uh, she had already sunk eight ships in the eastern sea frontier, off the coast here. And her captain was Otto von Bülow. And he looks like a submarine captain should look, I think, in that picture. So uh, on June 24th, they sunk three ships. The next day, they spotted the 11-ship convoy. And uh, if I remember correctly, I read correctly, he, you know, he was submerged or did submerge, may have been submerged, but basically ended up in the middle of the convoy when he came up. So he basically couldn't miss. So he shot a spread of torpedoes. The first one hit was a, a freighter called the Nordall. And then the second one hit was the, the Manuela. And uh, three crewmen were killed instantly. Uh, the rest were, did survive and were picked up. But the interesting story is, and I haven't heard much about this, but I think it's cool. Uh, Coast Guard cutter spotted a man waving on the listing ship, on the manual, it was still afloat. And uh, this, the fireman of the ship had been knocked unconscious below deck, 
you know, when the blast occurred. When he came to, he was totally alone, no one there. He had uh, sh compound fractures of his arm and leg, and he had to crawl down the companionway and climb up ladders with compound fractures to make it to deck. So you know, obviously they did spot him and they took him off and rushed him to, to Moorhead City to the hospital. And uh, she was taken into tow because she was still afloat, but later she rolled over about 24 hours after she was torpedoed, she rolled over and sunk. But luckily for us, she was towed to shallower water. Now, the captain of the sub, Von Bulow, sunk 15 ships uh, during his career, and he was awarded the Iron Cross and the Knight's Cross with oak leaves. And he left the 404 for land duty on July 19th, 1943. Nine days later, I believe again in the Sea of Biscay, the 404 was depth charged, sunk, and there were no survivors. So basically, he lived because he got land duty. So he died in 2006 at the age of 94 years old. And she lies in 155 feet of water, although you can definitely hit deeper spots and washouts. And she's broken into three sections, as the, the Noah scan will show. Now, something I'll point out here, and I'll try to remember to point it out again. What you're going to see on my pictures are going to sort of mess your brain a little bit. Because the Noah shots, remember, she's laying on her starboard side, her right side. So the Noah shots are from this side, looking towards the hull that's laying sideways, right? So the bow would be to the left in this picture, and the sterns to the right in this picture. And in this case, we're going out on Dave Summers' boat, the Lion's Pole. Okay, so first we'll do the stern. Now, the way we're going to dive it is we're coming in from this side, so this side of the stern. So your directions are reversed, okay? So here we're coming down the anchor line towards the stern. Unfortunately, I don't have software that can increase the clarity of the picture. Now, if there was sound, you'd hear bubbles here. That's it. <laughs> Not a lot. And the prop, three-bladed prop. I can tell that's an older picture because uh, of the light that Penny's carrying. Not a real old picture, though, sometime in the last 10 years. Okay. All right, next we'll go to the midsection. And I like this shot because it looks like a shipwreck. Now remember, she's laying on her starboard side, so this way's the, the bow, that way's the stern. What you're seeing here is a little confusing. It's actually the deck of the ship, because she's this way. So the hull, almost pointed this, the hull's up there curving around. This hull is bow, or not bow, what am I saying? Uh, deck, decking. Something I forgot to mention, and it'll explain maybe a little bit, is about two months after the, she was sunk, uh, the Navy made on, on a, they had a contact. They had a suspicious contact. So that contact was multiple times depth charged by airplane. It was also depth charged by ship, and it turned out it was the Manuela. 
So the Manuela suffered a whole lot more damage after she sunk. And that may explain some of the, the damages. Mark just left and I needed him on this because there's something I can't identify later. I'm not sure of. Maybe someone else will know. Yeah, one of our friends with a rebreather, and I think he's, yeah, he's got his scooter there and his camera. Okay, and uh, this is Penny swimming towards the bow, and what I, well, stern, I think. I just got myself mixed up. Uh, this is what I'm not sure. I want to say it's a condenser, but there looks like pipes leading out the side away from it. So if anybody knows, I'd love to know for sure, is it a condenser or is it something else? Got a question mark, he came back. Do you know, is that, a can, let's take it forward, yeah. That, is that a condenser? That is the top of a boiler. Oh, it is? Okay. There's That's. Babcock and Wilcox high pressure boiler. Okay, because I saw this. Yeah, because it was a steam turbine mm -hmm. engine, right? Yeah. Yep. Okay, now I know. Thank you. See, I didn't want to give you bad information. Just love the visibility on that wreck. I think one time we had like 60 foot visibility and I was so disappointed because <laughs> usually it's gorgeous and 60 is not bad. <laughs> and lionfish, you can see a lionfish right in front of Penny, which we love dead lionfish. Another of my favorites, I love it when there's good visibility, even with my less impressive camera, you can get some good shots. And actually, it worked out good. Even with two, it's still a little short, so you'll have plenty of time for lunch because I think we're almost finished, except for one of my favorite shots. So this time we're gonna do the bow. And the bow's pretty cool to me. And not this part of it. And there's a grouper. And I'm not sure if it's a, uh, what do I think? I'm not sure if it's a black grouper. That's a scamp. What's it called? Scamp. Scamp? Thank you. I have a. Broomtail. Yeah, I have a f book, but it's mostly bohemian waters, right? And it's like, oh, I can't find it. Scamp. Thank you. And of course, lionfish. Lionfish are all over. Again, I can remember in the early days, you never saw a lionfish. And the first time we saw a lionfish was, wow, look at that, it's a lionfish. And now they're just everywhere. And of course, fewer reef, ship, reef fish because they're eating all the young. They are pretty, especially when they're dead or on your plate to eat. Okay, this is, I love this picture because it's sort of like a shipwreck supposed to look, laying on the side, the bow section, you know, the uh, anchor chain going into the hauser. And Penny swimming across to it. And we have bollards for the, the lines. And then this is a, a windlass, probably to pull in the dock lines. You go through the bollard and crank it in because these are the ones that are for the chain that actually I'm having trouble seeing sideways here, but I think these are the, what brings in the chain. Another shot of the bollard and the winch or windlass. Queen angelfish. <laughs> and a hauser pipe with a little bigger one, 
or the boat, Penny, Penny and I lived on a 40-foot sailboat for tw 12 years, and my hawser pipe was about that big <laughs> with a chain. And chain with lionfish. And I don't know if you, this one you don't quite see it as well, but it's a navy anchor. Here, I think the next picture is clear. Yeah, there you can see it. And if you notice, someone's grappling hooks caught in there, the chain around. And, and actually, when I took this picture, we were on JT's boat, and when I said something about the, the grappling, why the hell didn't you bring it up? Because <laughs> that's not what I was there for. Penny behind the anchor. And I think we're coming to the end. And unfortunately, Paul Huddy's not here, but he's given us a thumbs up for a good dive. And that's it. Thank you. And you're going to get to eat on time. <laughs>